Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. Welcome back to How to Connect with Humans. <laughs> This is a very serious series um, of talks, as you can see. So this is episode three on series two. We come, we still can't believe it. Um, hello. How are you? No, I'm good. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, it's nice and warm. Yeah, we look cozy to be here, like very stuck together. Um, so today we have a really, really amazing, oh my God, we love her so much, yeah. uh, special guest all the way from Arizona in the United States. Um, so our special guest is Linda Pettit. And, um, and Linda is really, really very dear to her heart. And, uh, but if we weren't very sure, she came very highly recommended by our guest last week. Uh, <laughs> He said, like, probably after Sydney Banks, uh, and, and I'm not sure if he said that. He said, like, it's like he's like the best teacher, did. the best teacher he's had in his life. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Linda has um, Linda works internationally with people, and uh, which let her introduce herself as well. Uh, and she she's a psychologist that has uh, uh, also work a lot with uh, her spiritual journey. So uh, when we talked with Linda, she decided to call this episode um, Unleashing Intuition, the Magic of the Three Principles. So thank you very much for being here. We love you so much, Linda. Hello. <laughs> Hello. And the feeling is so mutual. So mutual. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> So I, I'd like I'd like to keep this really informal and don't feel like you have to wait if a question comes up or you want to make a comment. And my uh, encouragement would be that you put your hand up. Do you know how to, I know how to do that through Zoom? Put your hand up. I believe it's on. Let me just double check. It's on participants, on the little thing that says participants, the two little Yeah, it's on the participants and you can just put your hand out. Yeah. So it says, yeah. says raise your hand. And I'll try to watch for that, but there are also a lot of you on my screen. So, yeah. if I don't so we, we, have, we have a few devices so we can like keep having a look. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. also just in case there's anything else, just, 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 just go like that or, just, you know. Yeah. The, the the actual what's that? Yeah, until some somebody sees you, and then we'll try to just uh, <laughs> try, try try for this to be as conversational yeah. as as possible. Um, I don't know about you, but I do a lot of zooming yeah. and sitting and watching talking heads after a while. Get yeah, it's fatiguing. It's kind of tiring. So I'll try to keep it as engaging as possible by engaging you. This is a really, to me, it's a really fun topic, and it's it's a topic that I've only recently begun to talk about with regard to my three principles work, because frankly, some of the connections that I see now, even two years ago, I didn't see, and and so it's a it's a kind of an ongoing, uh, it's an ongoing journey. Uh, I've been what I. I consider to be intuitive all my life uh, in that I sometimes would know things, see things, have visions for things. Uh, I have had prophetic um, audio information come to me, uh, both, both small things that have saved my life, but also just other things related to the world. And I've always just kind of wondered about that. I've never really courted it, courted it, you know, tried to make it stronger or anything. But I, but I've also, I've always been fascinated with why it seemed that there were times that the flow of that was really strong, and then other times when the flow of that was was you know just minimal or kind of disjointed. And now I feel like I understand that. So I thought I, I thought I would start by just sharing a little bit of an experience I had that actually was a prophetic uh, introduction to Sydney Banks, just to give you a sense of how this occurs in my life. So, and in a lot of people's lives, I find that when I can get people talking about this, I realize that it's a, it's a very ordinary thing and it's very magic. Uh, I, after my first husband died uh, in 1999, I was in deep grief for you know, a, a while. 
uh, it probably took me about 18 months before I felt like I was, I was in a new normal in terms of my life. And about a year after his death, maybe a little more, I uh, decided to go to Hawaii, take a trip with my daughter and my mother and father and my daughter's best friend's mother and her and her daughter. So my daughter's best friend. And uh, I was I, at the time I'd been reading books by Hank Wesselman, which are uh, books about uh, Hawaiian shamanism. And Hank is a very well-known PhD uh, eth ethno ethnologist, not, uh, ethnologist, I think, and he, he, he researches fossils. And so it had taken a lot, he had taken a lot of time in Africa and uh, had spent a lot of time among indigenous peoples. And his academic scholarship had really been impacted by uh, their more mystical understanding of the world. And then he started to have spontaneous visions, much to his surprise. His visions, though, were very interesting in that they were conversations with his descendants, not with his ancestors, with his descendants, with people who had come many, many years after him that talked about some things that had happened in the world. And I, I was fascinated by them. And in the book, he talked about kahunas, uh, Hawaiian teachers, and you know Sid Banks talked about kahunas. Uh, Mama Lila in his book Second Chance and Quest of the Pearl is the quintessential uh, kahuna. And I, so I was fascinated. So one day I called Hank Wesselman up. I found his number. This was early in the internet era, and I thought it was the number of a publisher. So I dialed this number, and this man answers, and he says, "This is Hank Wesselman." And I was like, oh my God, I'm talking to the author of this book. And I, I said, well, Hank, I just read your book and I'm, I'm like, I'm amazed by it and I want to meet a kahuna. And he starts laughing, laughing, laughing. And, and I said, like, what are you laughing at? And he said, well, Linda, uh, it's not like kahunas give business cards and that I can pass along a business card and you can call them up and go make an appointment with them. If you're meant to meet a kahuna, you will. So put it out there that you want to meet a kahuna. So I did. And then I kind of forgot about it. And, and my mother and my father and my sister and their best friend and their mother, we go to Hawaii together. We fly to the island of Molokai. And Molokai is a very mystical island. It's an island in the Hawaii's that was always thought to be sort of a spiritual center. And it's not widely inhabited. Most people don't even know it exists unless they're familiar with the leper colony that was in Hawaii, that was on Molokai. And we had booked at a, an ecotourism ranch, uh, which was a little bit of a stretch for my parents who were elderly. My dad had Parkinson's disease and getting around was a little hard, but he agreed to go along with it. So we get there and discover that our, our accommodation are actually tentalos, they're outside. So the bed is under kind of a big tent, but the, the loo and the kind of living area, the cooking area was all uh, outside. They're kind of cool. Well, we get there, we're jet lagged, we go to sleep. That night I keep waking up hearing a Hawaiian owl. And I know that an owl is a mystical omen. It's a symbol of something coming. And I'm very curious about that. I hear, keep hearing this owl. Next morning I get up, I go for a walk and I run into my mother who at the time was probably in her, I don't know, 70s, she's, she's almost 90 now. And she's walking around and, and she says, we start to walk together and she says, Linda, did you hear the drums last night? And I said, no, what drums? And she said, oh my God, I can't believe you're asking. They were so loud. Did you hear the drums? And I said, no, mom, I didn't hear any drums. I kept hearing an owl all night. I think I would have heard drums because I was up. I wasn't sleeping well. Oh, my God, there were drums that kept me up all night. So a little bit later, we go up for breakfast at a sort of central pavilion. And we, I decide that I'm going to book a, a kayaking, ocean kayaking for my daughter and her friend. And we go up to the concierge, lovely Hawaiian woman, young woman with dark flowing hair, big, 
dark eyes, beautiful skin, and we're booking the event. And I said, by the way, my mom said she heard drums last night on the island. Is there a drum corps on the island? Did you have some, is there some sort of drumming powwow going on among Hawaiians that we might be able to take in and hear and listen to? She looks very quizzical and she said, no, I'm not aware of anything going on on the island relating to drums. And then my mother, God bless her, says, oh, and what's really interesting is that I heard them in my deaf ear. My mother is completely deaf in one of her ears and she always sleeps on the opposite ear so she can't hear anything. It's a real quiet experience for her to sleep in. I look at her and I said, mom, you didn't tell me that you heard the drums in my deaf ear, in your deaf ear. And she said, oh yeah, that was what was so strange about him. I don't hear anything out of my deaf ear. So the woman behind the counter, the concierge, the Hawaiian woman is, her eyes have, have like widened to be saucers. And she says, what tentalo are you in? And my mom says, uh, she tells her the number. She says, just a minute, please. And she looks through a book and then all of a sudden she's on the phone and she's kind of talking in hushed tones to someone. And she comes back and she says, well, uh, this resort was built on an ancient spiritual site, an ancient Hawaiian spiritual site. And we've only recently discovered through excavation that a number of the tentalos that you're staying in were built on heiaus. Heiaus are, are altars, Hawaiian altars. And the way we became aware of this was that uh, a number of our guests have had visions and visionary experiences that have been somewhat frightening to them. And she said, you, Mrs. Sandell, uh, are in one of the hay, uh, the tentalos that we know was built right on a heiau. So we have reason to believe that you had a visionary experience. And just to make sure that you're grounded in that, we need you to meet Uncle Larry. Now I'm freaking out inside because I know the fact that she's called him Uncle Larry means that he's a kahuna. So Uncle Larry met with us that night and uh, it was very interesting. Everybody in our party, they wanted to meet with all of us. Everybody in our party instantly fell asleep, except for my mother and I. And Uncle Larry said, I don't know why, but I've been guided to share with you some aspects of Hawaiian spirituality that normally we do not talk to Hawaiians about. So Hawaiians are white people. And, uh, and so he shared uh, a number of things about Hawaiian spirituality, some of which I remember, some of which I don't. But the very next morning after that experience, uh, we walked up to have breakfast and Uncle Larry came over and, and said to me, would you come with me please, I need to speak to you. And so we went and sat down and he said, uh, I don't think you know this, but there are other people on the island who are ancient healers who have noticed that you have um, a very bright third eye and it's shining very strongly. I don't know, you know, if you know the third eye, it's a triangular place on the forehead. I was familiar with it, but I didn't know much about it. And he said, you're a healer. And, and he said, and I'm guided to tell you something that's very important. So he tapped my third eye real hard. And he, he reached over the table and did that. And he said, so listen up. And I got really quiet. And he said, a teacher is coming into your life probably not right away, it might take a year or so, but he is coming to teach you about the power and gift of thought. You listen up because he's one of the few people in history who have been given, given the depth of understanding that he has. Your meeting him will be a gift. Well, I had no idea what they what he meant, but I went and I looked in all kinds of mystical literature for something that would explain to me uh, what thought was and, and what he meant by that. And I really didn't find much. And then about a year later, uh, someone came up to me kind of spontaneously in a group that I led uh, for holistic healers and said, you know, Linda, 
there's a guy up at West Virginia University that I think you ought to meet. Uh, I think that you would be very interested in what he's talking about. He's talking about the power of thought. And so I looked on the internet and I found the Sydney Banks Institute for Innate Health. And I read a little bit about it, but I can't say that it had a great deal of resonance for me. So here's, so, so I have this prophetic experience, this prophetic synchronistic experience of meeting this man who says a teacher of thought is coming. I've learned to trust that. That's happened all my life. I knew that someone was in fact coming. Well, so then the next funny synchronistic experience was I was scheduled to give a talk at the university um, for the Center for Integrative Medicine on the power of unconditional love and healing on Valentine's Day, February 14th. And the day before the talk, I was actually in Michigan, which is about 400 miles north, attending my uh, mother-in-law for my first marriage's funeral. And I noticed that a big storm was coming up the north coast, northeastern coast, and it was scheduled to be one of the biggest storms the United States have ever, has ever experienced. And I was afraid that I wasn't going to be able to do that um, talk. So I called the man who had booked me and I said, you better get a backup because I'm going to try to make it to home so I can do this. But I don't know that, I'm, that I will beat the storm. As it turned out, I actually did beat the storm. I got there. I gave the talk. Bill my husband was on his way to lunch, saw my picture sitting outside of the conference room door and said something about the picture really pulled him in. And the title of my talk really pulled him in, The Power of Unconditional Love and Healing. And he said he stood there for a while and he said, Linda, Pe Linda Sandell, lunch. Linda Sandell, lunch. <laughs> Linda Sandell, lunch. And Linda Sandell went out and he came in and he sat down. So I gave the talk and uh, at, the, at the end of the talk, he walked up to me. He had a book that his first white wife wrote. Uh, it's called Coming Home by Sue Pettit. He put a business card in it and he handed it to me and he said, I think we have a lot in common. I'd really love to get together with you for dinner sometime in the future. And I said, you know, that would be nice. I'll look into it. And he went his way. I went my way. I drove the 120 miles south to my house. Just as I was rolling into town, the ice started coming down. And we had the most hellacious ice storm I've ever experienced. It took out the entire power grid in the county that I lived in. So I was alone in my house in the forest, on the hill, for over 10 days with no communication with anyone. Uh, my daughter had gone to stay with a friend, so she wasn't home. And uh, I had my wood stove for heat. I had my lantern and my flashlight for light. And for 10 days, I couldn't do very much except read and eat. And at one point, I was moved to open the book Bill had given me. I opened it directly to where his business card was. And he had put it right on a book, a poem about turtles. It's actually a poem about the principles, but in that part of the poem, uh, his wife was talking about, his that late wife was talking about turtles. My late husband, uh, his spirit Amakua was the sea turtle. He lived in the Philippines uh, for 20 years and had developed a great love of sea turtles. So when I read that, my first thought was, I meant to have a very important relationship with this man. I don't know if it's personal or professional, but I know it's meant to be. Fast forward, we were married um, six months later and about a week after we were married, Sid Banks called and said, I want to meet you, Linda and invited us to Salt Spring to spend a week with him. And so in November, uh, we went to Salt Spring and that's when I met Sid, the teacher of thought. Well, that's how I live life. I just live knowing that I'm being guided 
by intuitive awareness and synchronicity, uh, things that happen that you connect them and you know they have meaning, even though sometimes initially the meaning is not clear. So I hear about the principles and what I see immediately is the answer that I had been looking for about why I sometimes experience this flow of intuition and synchronicity and why I sometimes don't. And it is immediately clear to me that the only time that synchronicity and intuition slow down is when I'm in my personal thinking, when I'm caught up in that. And that, so I, I did see immediately that thought and feeling were connected and that was huge. Oh, I'm creating all these feelings. They're coming from thought. There's an absolute one-to-one -one relationship. I live in a world of thought feeling connected. And at the molecular level, at the, at the level of what can be studied, those two things are not separate. They occur spontaneously and, and, and at the exact same moment. And that was really beautiful for me. But the even more beautiful thing was that awareness that, that intuition and synchronicity were always and everywhere and that the only way I could feel disconnected from them was when I was in my personal thought. But in, at that point, I didn't see that Sid talked a lot about intuition. And so I stopped talking about, I just, I talked about the principles. But a couple of years ago, I was reading the uh, In Quest of the Pearl again. I read that, so I read that every time I go on vacation. And I read it in one place where Sid said, uh, love, he actually says aloha is love. Love is an intuitive way of life. Knowing what to do and when to do it. Giving without fear or need of return. Trusting in the great abundance of life. And I, I just suddenly had this awareness, oh my gosh, there it is. Sid talked about intuition. Love is an intuitive way of life. Love and intuition are synonymous. They're the same thing. And then I read, went back and read the second chance again and was aware that several times in the second chance, uh, Sid talks about how his, uh, the student in that book, Richard, was pulled toward things. He talks about how there was an energy that he felt in the air that pulled him toward things. And I thought, oh my God, how could I have missed that? That's what I experience. I experience all the time that I'm being pulled towards something drawn towards something. Something is being pulled or called out of me. Wow, he talked about intuition. And then recently in the Enlightened Garden Re Revisited, which I was reading for maybe the fifth or sixth time, probably the book I'd re read the least, I was aware that his primary teacher there, Andy, uh, his wife, Emily, speaks of Andy of always knowing what to do of seeming to have unlimited information about what to do, about how he's guided. And he talks about how even in a time of great depression, they made it through without undue suffering because Andy always seemed to know what to do. And most of the time, what to do was to give, to give, to give, to give to take care of others, to listen, to hear what you hear, and then to give and take care of others, to just give it away. And something about all of that just really unleashed my own willingness to talk about intuition and my, my own awareness that, that intuition could very well be a metaphor for the three principles. You know, people sometimes forget that Sid talked about the principles as a metaphor 
They're a metaphor, he said. The reason people don't understand them is they get too lost in the metaphor and forget what I'm pointing to. And what I'm pointing to always and everywhere and every time is love. So the way I look at intuition right now is that we are love and mo love is coming through us. It's just pumping through us all the time. And it flows uninhibited unless we have our eyes closed. And I don't know about you, but my eyes are closed a lot. I bump into things constantly. <laughs> I bump into my thinking all the time. I bump into the furniture of my thoughts. I stub my toe on my thoughts. I, I bump into people around me without really seeing them. But if my eyes are open, love just flows through and I see clearly. I see people's hearts. I see what's in people's hearts. I sometimes get information about them. I get information about the world. I get information about myself. And, and sometimes that information is confirmed, more often than not, with synchronistic happenings. Because the universe is all one. It's all connected. It's like a, it's like a divine flow that's all connected. So we should expect that we're going to see miracles of synchronicity around us all the time. And when I see them, life feels to me like a gigantic magic carpet ride of miracles happening in front of me, guiding me in little things and in big things. So I'm going to stop there and just check in and see if there are any questions or, uh, or thoughts before I go forward. Yeah. So let us uh, sort of let people unmute themselves. And um, thank you so much for that. Um, I. Um, to be honest, like this series has a lot to do with Linda giving me particularly a hand and getting me out of a state where I felt in a lot of grief and and she just very kindly sort of sort of helped me see that light and that love. And what I knew very clearly is that we wanted to give, I wanted to give without having to think what we're gonna receive um, and that we were very clear about. And once I stopped bumping into my own grief thinking, um, it became very clear and that's exactly what happened, which is, which I thought that's what we want. What we do best is we, we connect with humans. So we know we're all connected, but we sort of, make something happen where we are actually being in communication. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, to your, you know, to, to, to say that absolutely, you just, you just also pointed me to, to just follow that intuition, you'll know where, where um, you're supposed to be. So Andrea has, a, has a, her hand up and Michelle, so I don't know who of you guys put the guy, the, the hand up first. So I'll say Andrea, just uh, if you want to mute yourself. You... Hi there. Hi. Hi, actually I, I was so... It's Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry Hi. about that. That's okay. Um, and it's Lee. Just it to is you Lee. Lee. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, Thank you. I, I loved, I'm going to put gallery because I can't, oh, there, there you are, Linda. Hi, Linda. Hi. Um, I, I um, loved what you said there, and, and I've changed my question in actual fact because the synchronicity part, I love that. And it's not, in my opinion anyway, it's not talked so much in the principles. And what I, I want to ask is <laughs> the Andrea part of this. And my wife, <laughs> I, used, I used to say that, you know, she would trip over herself and it would be a sign. She would like <laughs> see, see, you know, a, a Van Gogh painting um, replica and say that that was a sign and like everything on the planet seemed to be a sign and and i went the other way it's like no 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 we're not looking outside of ourselves right so in terms of principles 
it's not the idea to look outside of ourselves. So it seems obvious in one sense, I could answer this myself, but I'd love your opinion on how do you know the difference? That's a, that's a really good question. And let me just say that, um, you know, Sid did say, look within. And he also said, I'm not talking about looking within your body. Right. Now, when we look within, we tend to think about our bodies, don't we? I mean, I, when I look within and I close my eyes, I'm aware of, I'm aware of sensation within the body. And I think the body is a gift. It's a gift of consciousness. It's what we were given, the vehicle we were given to, to have consciousness. It's, it's, the, it's what the soul produces in order for us to have consciousness, to have an experience of life. But I think the within Sid was talking about is within life itself. Look within life itself, the all of it, the allness, the isness, the greatness, and the great nothingness, everything. You know, Sid talked about that, that life could be conceived of as a, a giant cell with an arbitrary line in the middle. And, and the top half is the physical world and the bottom half is the spiritual world. But they're, they're, they're in, inextricably connected. They cannot be separated. They're the same thing in a different disguise. So I think that's the within Sid was talking about. So of course, we're going to see from within life the manifestation of the oneness. But, but I, think, I think some people get confused about what wisdom is and what it isn't. Well, Sid offered some guidance about that, too. One of my favorite pieces of guidance was that he said, wisdom comes like uh, the bleed of the lamb, not the roar of the lion. Wisdom is a whisper. Wisdom is a whisper. Wisdom is never disturbing. Wisdom is never disturbing. Now, I'll give you an, a really clear example of how I see this. Uh, years ago, on July 3rd, I don't remember what the year was. It was two years after my husband died. My daughter was had just learned to drive. And I had a dream on July 3rd that she was in a terrible car accident. And, and in the dream, the because the, I, I get these clear audience things, the, the voice that came through was kind of, it was, it was like one of these disembodied voices that I sometimes hear that is not 100% clear to me. But the voice said um, something about the Williams, Williams, I heard the word Williams, but the message that came was really clear. Do not be afraid. She will be banged up, but okay. I woke up and I was like, shit, what was that about? And I thought the only thing I can think of to do is, oh, my daughter plays basketball and volleyball in Williamstown, Williamston. And so I said to her, uh, honey, the next time you're driving in Williamstown or Williamston, be extra careful. Just go slow. She's like, she knows me. She's like, mom. <laughs> well, the very next night, uh, I knew something was going to happen because that morning I was visited by hawks cawing around my porch. And I thought something is up. I mean, this is not normal. That night at about 10 o'clock at night, I get a call from my daughter's best friend's mother and I can tell something's wrong her voice is really shaky and she said Linda take a deep breath uh, Laura's been in a terrible accident uh, the car is wrecked it happened in front of the Williams residence is banged up but she's okay now as a mother who 18 months before lost her husband in a car accident, if I had gotten that no, no notice unprepared, I think I probably would have lost my friggin' mind. 
but I was just really quiet and I thought, okay, she's banged up and she's okay. And I was very calm. I called my some friends to drive me to the hospital and it went on from there. But I thought that's so interesting that that was disturbing information, but it was not disturbing to receive it. It just had this sort of like comfort. Like you're being given this as a comfort. Hang on to it. It's going to be okay. And I later, so when I meet Sid and I read some of what he writes about wisdom, that really clarified for me. When, when intuition comes, when true intuition comes, when true wisdom comes, it's a comfort. It's not disturbing. It's subtle. It's nuanced. But here's the other thing. Sometimes when, when the ego hears wisdom, it goes into overdrive. Sid told us to expect that. He said, when the ego hears wisdom, Wisdom, it gets, the word he uses is it gets jarred. And, it, and if you have kind of a big ego, that means that you're going to get really jarred. So if you're really wedded to your thought system, you run the risk of being really jarred. Well, I was really, I'm really grateful that I have that separation, that detachment from my personal thought system, because it, it, it both has become easier to hear the nuances of wisdom the subtleness of it, the whisper of it, and also not to get jarred by it, to know that my mind can take off with it. And, uh, and that's okay, that's all that's happening. And then to just wait. And normally for me, when I have some intuitive flow, uh, I will see it confirmed by some sort of synchronicity, something happening outside of me. So when that, that dream came to me about my daughter, uh, and, and I saw the hawks, the hawks were like a synchronicity, you know, but, but they were cawing the way they did. It was like, oh, something's up, but the universe has my back. It's nothing to worry about, but kind of take a deep breath. Something is coming. Now, so here's the funny part, one of the funny parts. When I first meet Sid, I'm like, great. I'm finally going to get an explanation for all this stuff that I experience, right? So I go to lunch with him one day. I think it was the first day I met him. And I'm and I when I met Sid, uh, I just all the questions I had just fell away. I was just really quiet and I listened and I couldn't think of anything I really wanted to ask him. I was much more interested in hearing his voice than mine. And, but after a while, it, Bill went to the bathroom and I thought, oh, okay, he's gone. I can finally ask this question. So so I said, Sid. All my life, I've had premonitional experiences. All my life, I've heard things in dreams. All my life, I've dreamed of things that were going to happen. All my life, I've had visions that have helped me greatly in my work with people. Um, I don't make a big deal out of it. I really don't share it all that much. It's just a personal thing. But how did the principles explain that? How did the principles explain that? And Sid looked at me and he got kind of a big smile. He had this wonderful smile. He got a big smile on his face and he said, well, Linda, and I'm waiting for the flow of teaching. I don't know. <laughs> and I'm like, you don't know. And I know he's not telling the truth. And his wife, Judy, is sitting next to him and she elbows him in the side. And she said, Sidney Banks, you do too know. And he throws his head back and he laughs and he looks at Judy and he says, well, Judy, what do I know? And Judy says, very matter of factly, that's just her manner. She says, very matter of factly and pragmatically, anybody can see outside the boundaries of time, space and matter. It's not special. Now, all kinds of dominoes fall in my head because I've been trained as, as a psychologist and as someone who hung around Carl Jung and did a lot of study of archetypes that somehow intuition is special. And I measured on the Myers-Briggs as a double I, a double introvert. And a double introvert has special access to intuition and the flow of intuitive information. 
And I'm a woman. <laughs> women have more access to intuitive flow of information. And here is this man who I know already, even though I'd only been with him a few hours, knew something very deep and very profound about life, telling the truth. And I knew it was true. It's not special. Anyone can experience it. And that was really beautiful because I began to trust the intuitive flow of information coming not only to myself, but to everyone. That's much less interested in sharing any intuitive sense that I had with anyone else and much more interested in helping them find their own intuitive flow. So yes, I think it's all around us. Um, and that has, been, that has been a teaching in indigenous wisdom for eons. And, and in, indigenous wisdom, in indigenous wisdom, people do pay a lot of attention to signs and symbols and they read them uh, as a way of life. Uh, but again, I, I think the symbols that matter, the, the meaning that counts, the synchronicities that are really worth our attention, are those that are always taking us in the direction of a positive feeling. That are always providing comfort because somehow they show us the next right thing, the next step. So I'll tell you, Lee, probably a dozen times in my life, I've had thoughts as I got on an airplane, this plane is gonna go down. And, and I, you know, I get a little like tightening in my tummy and, and I just step back a little bit and I think about it and I think, wait a minute, is this a comfort to me? Right. Yes. Yes. If it's not, I pay zero attention to it. Mm. Because my thought is, if I'm asking that question and it's my time to die, I'll be comforted by that. That's amazing. Because I know dying is going home. I know dying is reconnecting with the formless, the formless love. Nothing to be afraid of. Now, I haven't had a near-death experience. I've known a lot of people who have. I've talked a lot to a number of them who've had them. Uh, Sid talked about how he didn't have a near-death experience. He had the full death experience. It was, it's interesting, isn't it? But he said, I did not have a near-death experience. I had the full-death experience. Ah, that's interesting. Uh, and, and, but what he said after that was, death is nothing to be afraid of. Nothing to be afraid of. In that moment of death, the full, full illumination of mind is born. Now, I don't know what that means, but it sounds 100% cool. <laughs> And, and I know the truth of what Sid pointed to enough personally that I'm willing to trust him on that one, even though I don't have direct knowing about it. I love that. Thank you. That, that's full clarity. Because, yes, you, yeah, sometimes I loved what you said. You get on a plane and sometimes you, you get that sort of crazy feeling and, and then does that, is this wisdom, is this... That's perfect, perfect clarity. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. One time I was at a traffic light in Toledo, Ohio. I was pregnant with my daughter and uh, I was just sitting there. I was the first car and you know, I was in the center lane and there was a car next to me and the light turned green and I heard, do not move. Mm -hmm. And it was just that's that like a whisper in my ear. Do not move. I didn't feel afraid. I actually felt that comfort. It was like, huh, what's up with that? And the car next to me went and was broadsided by a car coming in the other direction. Now, fortunately, because there was a lag, uh, the accident didn't produce any injuries. But had I gone first, 
I would have taken it, you know, full on with much less time for the driver to stop. But that kind of thing is, as I started to look back on all of those experiences, I thought, yeah, this is right. It's a whisper, it comforts, it's a knowing. It comes with a knowing feeling, a certainty, but there's no fear attached to it until the ego gets involved and starts doing its thing. I mean, after the car, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and then a full blown moment of, you know, like panic, but I was fine. That's incredible. Yeah. So it's always a compliment. So not necessarily a good feeling, but certainly not a bad feeling. Well, you know, when Sid, would, when I first started listening to Sid, and I went to a lot of uh, things that he did and had a lot of private times with him, with Bill, he would kept talking about, look, listen to my feeling, don't listen to the words, listen to my feeling, don't listen to the words. And I would sit there and I would think, what the hell feeling is he talking about? He said, Some of you may have had like a moment of great insight where you saw the principles and life was never the same. I didn't have that. I had two years of anger and upset. I had a big ego. I got a real big jarring. And I was I was determined that I was not going to share this with anyone until it made sense to me. And I kind of lost my train of thought. Let me get it back. Uh, oh, so, so I would sit there in the audience as I was listening to Sid during those years. And I would think, so what feeling does Sid have right now? And I went through dozens of them, I think, love, man, nah. peacefulness, maybe. And then one day it just hit me, certainty. That's what he has. He has total certainty. There's no equivocation. There's no maybe. And I loved it when one day he said, people always say to me, Sid, you have to stop being so certain. It's arrogant. It just is arrogant. It sounds arrogant. And, and Sid said, well, my name was Harry. I wouldn't say my name was Paul. <laughs> Couldn't be certain about that because it wouldn't be true. And I got it that he was talking about certainty and the deep feeling of knowing, that's what that produces, is total certainty as you move forward. You know, like an example, when, when Bill and I were thinking about moving to Phoenix three years ago, we, we were living in Michigan, and we had come to Phoenix, and we'd actually gotten a realtor and looked around just to, just to get a sense of what housing prices were here in Phoenix. And our motivation for coming, if we were going to come, was that my daughter was here. And uh, she had just announced that she was pregnant with her first child. And also that we really had talked about getting out of the snow of the upper part of the country. It's really nice and warm here in Phoenix. And we had looked at at least 10 different options. We'd explored living in Hawaii. We'd explored going to the UK. We'd actually been invited to come to London. A number of different states and we were walking out on a trail that's near here one morning and Bill looked at me and he said Linda this is meant to be our home and I looked at him and I said I know and we had total certainty now what was really fascinating to me is that from that point the six-month journey of moving here flowed with ease now here's the distinction. It wasn't easy. There was a lot to do. We had to get new licenses. We had to sell, sell two homes. We had to move half of our belongings because we decided to, to spend some time up in the north with our other children too. Half of our belongings in one direction, half in the other, figure out what went here and there, arrange housing. It was, a, it was nuts for six months. It wasn't easy. But it was, it was totally with ease. We just kept listening in, inward. Okay, this is the next thing. This is the next thing. This is the next thing. And we were really in that flow of love, that feeling of aloha and trust that we were on, on the right track. Right. Fantastic. So you basically just followed your GPS? 
like turn by turn. And I guess with that certainty, had you not had that, you wouldn't have the, one of a better word, the guts to go ahead, I guess. Yeah. That's incredible. And this is it's, it's so beautiful. Is like as you pointing to so beautifully, Lee. This you know this. You know this. Everybody knows this. This is as Judy pointed out so beautifully. It's not special, and in a way, it is incredibly special, especially in these times of great uncertainty. To know that every single one of us is being guided through them. Incredible. Absolutely. Some, somebody else had a uh, question or a comment. Yes, too. Michelle. So, Michelle, you can unmute yourself. Hello. Hi, Michelle. Hey, so I just wanted to ask you a question because, um, and Carolina knows this already, I, I, I'm getting the whispers. One thing I've also been aware of is like I, I can see something, you know, just out, out and about or in the house or whatever, and it will literally jump out at me. And I, I know it's important for some reason. It might not fall into place at that given time, but, it, you know, later on, it, things like fall into place. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so... I have two things. Um, so today I had this the whisper, um, I think it was on Sunday that I need to move. And then I don't know, I was just like, okay, where do I go? I just asked the question and I got the answer straight back. And it was I was a bit sort of, whoa, <laughs> okay. And the answer that I got was like. It felt like the most illogical thing to do. It felt like I was going backwards rather than forwards. And since then, I have had... Um, so I, I came into the living room after this had happened. I dropped my water bottle on the floor. And I was... As I bent to pick it up, I was staring at the front of a book and it said forward. And it, it wasn't spelt as for what it was spelt as the foreword of, of a book by somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, right, okay, that's telling me that's not going backwards. Then today, <laughs> just it's it's just amazing how it happens. And I th I think what you said, it just really struck me is that it's not special because we've all got access to it, but it is really special. It really is special. Today, I went to get my phone out of my bag. And as I took the phone out of my bag, a, a 50 pence piece was sort of stuck to the bottom of my phone. And I just knew that that meant I had to go and put some air in my tires. So obviously the universe knows where I go to put air in my tires. As I'm driving, because the thing about this move for me is it's it feels like quite a, a chore. Um, as I was driving up the hill to go to this garage, there was a sign on the side of the road that said "Easy Move." <laughs> and you know when you just you know when you just go like "Thank you very much." That's the com. No, it's not. It's not, I, did, I didn't feel like I needed confirmation that, of that whisper, but everywhere, like literally things have been happening in the last couple of days that have been like, you know, you're going to be okay. Yes, it's fine. Um, and even when I was at the garage, there was a lorry and I thought it said hands on scaffolding. And I was like, okay, Michelle, that's your sign, right? You need to start getting stuff organized now. Um, and actually, when I read it again, it was H and Sons scaffolding. But you know that, so do you get, 
do you well I guess my question is do you get things like that happening to you where things will like literally jump out at you and oh yeah all the time and I absolutely trust that but let me say this when I was listening to you Michelle a couple of really important things came to mind so I think someone listening to this conversation could reasonably ask does that mean that the universe is determined that there's one right way forward or there's one right way, uh, there's, there's a right answer to all questions. I can't say that I know for sure, but my senses know that that's not true, that, that the universe is a series of billions of moving parts and bits that are shifting all the time. And what while we may get guidance in one moment, it's possible that, that things shift beyond our seeing that open up other options. So I, I see us as co-creators of our lives. And I kind of, the way I look at that kind of information is, it's like, especially if there is a series of things, like I get an intuitive flow and then I see a number of synchronistic occurrences. Um, to me, it's like a green light okay, you can go in that direction and it's probably going to unfold with pretty much ease. Not easiness, but ease. But I also truly, truly see for myself based on my experience that I have the option of saying no, thank you. That's not for me right now. And, and I, I think the creator behind life, the mind behind life, just bears that neutrally and says, okay, I'll show you the next right thing. Okay. I, re I remember Elsie Spittle and I were talking once about, about this topic. And she was saying that she and Ken had, where they were moving and they wanted to buy a house. And uh, they had found a house that was perfect. They had spent some time talking about what they wanted and what, what they hoped it would show up like, and, and it had just materialized. It was perfect. And so they put their earnest money on the house, and everything seemed to be going beautifully. And, and then something happened that at the last minute they needed to respond to that they couldn't respond to because of timing, and they lost the house. And, and she said, lost it, meaning that someone else bought it. Uh, and, and, and they didn't lose their earnest money. They got it back, but they did not get the house. And, and she said, Ken and I were like kind of devastated for about 10 days. We walked around with this sort of like, how could that have happened? And, and then a realtor called up and said, uh, Elsa, you're not going to believe this, but I think I found a house that closer dream that you articulated and they went to look at it and she said it was it was just unbelievable how closely it fit the vision we had for where we wanted to live and how it filled in some gaps that the other one had left but, but we had been willing to accommodate and I said well how do you explain that Elsie and she said just just that wisdom shifts because we're all making choices every one of us is creating and as each of us create, all kinds of paths and possibilities and opportunities open. The other thing that I think is fascinating um, <clears throat> is that sometimes we are, we are asked to sit in a parking lot for a while <laughs> and just wait. Okay. I, re I remember um, the last... One of the last times I saw Sid in talking in person, he invited Mary Webb Martin on stage. Mary was at the time the head of the United Way in Des Moines, Iowa, and she was really responsible for the three principals coming into a very big city and impacting the schools and the, the hospitals and government. And it was what, what Mary was able to kind of get going with her team was is even today is truly astonishing and she's a beautiful humble lady with this incredibly light loving energy and said invited her on the stage and he asked her to talk about the principles 
and she shared this metaphor that I love. She said, for me, it's kind of like, love is like the wind in my sails. The principles are the wind in my sails. And sometimes there's this puff that comes along and I know what to do and thought is coming to me and I feel very guided by mind and I'm super conscious of what's happening. And then other times I'm quiet, but the wind has died down. And I'm just bobbing in the water. And I know the only thing to do while I'm bobbing in the water is to be very silent, to be very silent and wait so that I catch the first puff of wind when it comes. And Sid said, that's perfect, Mary, that's perfect. <laughs> I really love that. Yeah, I'm really struck in, in a book that Linda Quiring wrote about Sid. Uh, toward the end of his life, she was a friend of his who had a falling out with him actually, and then later made her peace with him. And one of the reasons she had a falling out with him from what I understand is that she thought his, when he started to talk about the principles, that the understanding got a little too psychological and that he wasn't talking as much about spirituality and the way and intuition the way he had been originally. And, and Linda was reported in the book as saying to Sid, Sid, why did you do that? Why did you stop talking so much, so spiritually the way you had in the beginning and start talking more about the principles? And Sid got tears in and he said, as Linda reported, he said, because, because Linda, as much as I tried, I couldn't help them understand the silence. Wow. I mean, that brings tears to my eyes because I know what he means. I know that in the great os, the great silence behind life, the great nothingness, that portal where we can sit at within that is so still and so quiet. That's where the answers come. That's where wisdom comes. That's where wisdom creeps in. And it comes through the soul and the soul speaks in images, symbols, and visions, and dreams, and, and sometimes in words. And then it's up to us to do our very best to receive that and, and go forward with it. And we cannot make a mistake. So I guess, I don't know if, if I just summarize what you've just said, that's like, you might get the, the you, you know, you get the whisper mm -hmm. um you might think it means xyz but it could turn out to mean you know it could turn out so it's kind of let go of the outcome really mm -hmm. yeah okay thank you very much and and and, and to know like like suppose suppose right now i i suddenly uh santorini showed up in my dreams and and uh, I came across a pamphlet for Santorini and I logged into my computer and an advertisement came up for Santorini. I might look at that and say, huh, that's interesting. Uh, do I want to make anything out of that? And I might even think I could create a really beautiful vacation in Santorini. But I might also say, no, no, thank you. I don't want to spend my money that way right now. And know that that would be okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle and Linda. Um, we have Karina uh, with her hand up. Mm -hmm. um, if you're happy to answer uh, another question. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Are you going to mute yourself, Karina, if you want? Can That's you hear me? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, great, great. So before I came into um, this webinar, I did have um, sort of the idea that we all have access to wisdom, but that some people had a gift of intuition. So, for example, um, I don't hear things or I haven't consciously seen things. Um, but from what you've been saying um, and calling it sort of ordinary, I'm just wondering if, if that was a misunderstanding on my part. Um, 
I'm just curious as to how some people have that sort of what I call deeper experience of, of wisdom um, and others don't. Um, and I'm just wondering what you have to say. Yeah. You know, there, there's, a, there's a place in, the, I think it's in the second chance where Sid speaks to that. And I'll bring that forward because it's really kind of sweet. Uh, he, uh, through his teacher, Jonathan, who's a bit of a trickster, right? He's a quintessential trickster teacher. And Sid could be that. Sid could also be like Mama Leela, like sort of the, you know, calm kahuna. Uh, but, but in that particular place, uh, Jonathan and Richard are walking past a woman who's reading a crystal ball, I think. She's, she's got a truck that says psychic on it. And um, Richard says to Jonathan, what do you think of mediums? And Jonathan says, well, I really like mediums. There are a lot of them in the world, but I'm, I like smalls and larges too. <laughs> And then says, through his character, Sid says something very interesting. One of the things that Jonathan says is, uh, my heart goes out to her because she's telling fortunes, but she's driving around an old, battered, rusted truck. And yet I know she has created exactly what she wants. And then he says, uh, a hunter is not a very good hunter if he barks up the wrong tree. But then in the next breath, Sid writes, and I'm not saying that there aren't people in the world who have very special gifts in this area. Now, the, what I think about that is the because I have run into I, I have one one or two psychics that I've known in my life. One of them who told me very clearly that Bill was coming into my life in six months, getting very specific information about that by reading the palm of my hands. Now, I didn't go to a palm reader deliberately. She she had showed up in a group that I ran that was trying to get doctors, physicians to use more holistic, complementary uh, forms of healing and to integrate those into their practices. And she showed up and I was like, oh my God, she's gonna make these doctors I'm working with go totally bonkers, you know, that there's a palm reader in this group. And she walked up to me at, uh, after the first meeting and she said, Linda, I know that I'm not good for this group. I know what will happen, that I will set back what you're trying to do and I totally support what you're trying to do. But would you at least come to lunch with me and let me show you how this works? So I went to lunch with her and she read my palms and it was, it was amazing. And she told me that Bill was coming and what to look for. And she says, be here in about six months. And he was, <laughs> and she told me that she was one of 10 children in a very strict Catholic family and nine of the 10 have psychic gifts. Now, one of the things I observed in her was incredible quiet that she would just sit and you could feel it that she was just, her mind was clear. And, and when she spoke, she spoke with that same certainty, that same sort of degree of certainty I saw in Sid. And while she would give prophetic kind of information, she also was really clear that we were free to uh, leave it be. And she would also say to me, and I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. And I had that strange phenomenon as she would talk, she talked about Bill. I was like, yeah, I know. I didn't know where that was coming from. Like a recognition sort of. Yeah. So, you know, I, one of the things about some of this that I, that I love is that, is, is that Sid wrote a number in a number of places. And he said in a number of places, when you accept the mystery, you join the mystery. So, so, why some people have more gifts or seem to come by the gift a little more easily than others. Uh, I wonder if they are old souls who have come a long way in their evolution toward going home and have just learned to access information a little more easily. But I don't know that for sure. I have a lot of wonderment around it. Mm -hmm. But I accept the, I accept the, um, accept the mystery of that. And, and I, 
I certainly would be very cautious myself about anyone I listen to who proclaim to have intuitive gifts. I mean, I'd be looking for, first and foremost, what Sid said about uh, a teacher. Are they happy? Are they content? Does their life show that they live in a flow of abundance? And I don't mean the kind of abundance of a big house or, you know, Bentleys or whatever. I mean, the, the, the sense of an abundant, well-lived life, a life of fullness. Yeah. Thank you. And, and then my other question is, I'm really curious how you incorporate this with your coaching. Um, Thanks, Kurt. That's a really good question. And really, up until the last year, I, I only did it within the boundaries of my own mind. So, so I learned years ago as a therapist, before I knew anything about the principles, that when I was in a quiet space, I would often get visions that told me exactly where to go with a client, where to probe, where to point, maybe sometimes even just to say, God, I just got this thought in my mind. I can't make sense of it. Does it make any sense to you? And it would open up incredible doorways. But I was always wary about bringing it into my three principles work. And part of why I was wary, because I'll just be very honest about this. When I was new to the community 18 years ago, and I shared the story about meeting the kahuna, a very well-known three principles teacher came up to me and said, don't ever share that story again. And I said, why? And this person said, because you'll confuse people. And so I, I really went underground with a lot of it. And, I, and I, don't, I don't think that was a bad thing. I'm actually really grateful because I don't think we were talking about the principles 18 years ago the way we're talking about them now. We've evolved. And I think Sid evolved from that point. And, and I think the world is ready for it. So what I heard recently was, because I was kind of one day sort of dumping on myself a little bit, like, God, why did I just let this go? And, and, and I, what I heard, and it was very clear, was uh, because it, if you had tried to bring what you see forward before this time, you would have been spitting in the wind and the spit would have ended up on your face but it's time now. And so at that point, I thought, hmm, it suddenly, it just like suddenly I had this whole evolution of thought that occurred. One of them was, oh my God, Sid used symbols all the time. He used archetypes all the time. You know, his book in quest of the pearl, the pearl is an ancient archetype. We all know that the pearl is created by the secretion of fluids over an irritation, a grain of sand, a grain of sand. It's a shorthand way of pointing toward the truth of the principles. Sid talked about the artist. The artist is an archetype. Sid talked about the sculptor. Sculptor is an archetype. Sid talked about the bridge. He talked about the key. They're all archetypes. They're all just shorthand symbols. They're, they're symbols that came up in his soul to use as he tried to point to what he was pointing to. And it was like, oh, for heaven's sakes, Linda, there's no reason not to integrate this into your work. I'm so and, glad to know. That's great. And it flows beautifully. It really flows beautifully. And some people aren't going to be attracted to it. And that's fine, you know, but some are. And I, I said in the thing I put out that I would talk a little bit about the divine feminine. I think the divine feminine is, feminine is finally rising. And, you know, Sid, Sid said there's no difference between men and women. And so for me, the divine feminine is an energy that is in all of us. It's not, it's not exclusively female not any gender. It is just a shorthand way, an archetypal way uh, of pointing to something. And the divine feminine is a synonym for love, but a certain kind of love. It's a self 
emptying love. It's a love without judgment. It's a love of forgiveness. It's a love of compassion. It's a love of unity. It's a love of oneness. It's a love that's unfettered by any prior belief. It's the love of the now. You know, so talked about the now is not a moment in time, but is but in a space where we are completely uncontaminated by any, any prior thought. And in that moment, we're not laying anything on it. And in that moment, the virgin creation can happen. Something new can be born. Well, birth is a uniquely feminine archetype. Giving birth is a uniquely feminine archetype. And it's not that men can't understand it. They can understand that archetype as deeply as a woman can. Uh, but it, it is the, the feminine archetypes to me that are really rising in the world today. And I think that's why people like myself and others in the three principal community are now feeling much freer to explore these symbols and bring forward and, and sort of look at the marriage of indigenous wisdom and, and the three principles. Because again, Sid said the three principles were a metaphor for love. And they're the logic of love. I am super clear for myself that they are my platform, but the platform frees me to speak even more deeply about things that are very meaningful to lots of other people. Does that answer your question, Karina? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I don't know if any anybody has another question or wants to share something. Um, and uh, and Linda, what you were saying, I I absolutely really really resonates with me because um, I think when I met Wayne about more than seven years ago, um, there was something about the kind of love that Wayne has, and uh, and and I think this is this. Uh, the best way of describing it's like he, he he has a very feminine way of loving without insulting you because <laughs> I know for him and the, and the way he's been sort of brought up it's just like like maybe confusing I don't know how you feel about that but he's got a very uh caring he's got a certainty in that love like we have met for like three days and i was saying i need to separate i uh, we're not happy with my husband and was like what's stopping you because well i have nobody i'm i can't do it on my own i i don't know how we do it on my own i, I said well you're not alone you have me and there was a certainty in your words there was a i'm here to stay and a caring voice that again embrace all his masculinity of like but it wasn't taking away my power sort of like you know it wasn't like oh don't worry you're damsel in this dress i'll take care of you it's like is that what you need is that what you think you need well here i am and um and i love you saying that because if not it looks like we're all women here going like or we're gonna take power over you, and you know, like it's 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 not like a fight. I love what you just said because it, it it's like it's for me. It, it wasn't kind of I wanted to take that power away from you, or I wanted to kind of you know take that responsibility away from you because you had to do that. But at the same time, it was whatever you needed at that time I was there I was supporting you yeah. I was kind of like a scaffolding that's holding a house that's falling down <laughs> that that's just the way you know and I love what you said about the intuition and everything like that Linda because it's like I've it's like I've said to you millions of times I've got this feeling inside me that 
something's always got my back. I know deep down inside me, whatever happens, I'm being guided. And I was guided that day when I said that to you. And here we are seven and a half years later. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he decided to stay. <laughs> <laughs> very, very lovingly. And um, yeah, and, and, and the other thing is that what I love in the way you work, Linda, is that you have, I, I can speak for myself, you have, I felt freedom of actually open it up also like this space to um to to just be whatever it wants to be just to take form in in whatever because um we trust that uh as far as we, we are all looking this way then people can express themselves and, and bring to form whatever they want that we are free not to have to go well, it's, it's only this, and if not, and I understand what you say about like helping people not get confused around it, but it's very freeing, especially hearing from somebody like you, very freeing for us to just go and do our thing in the way we feel that it can be done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what was Sid's number one point? His number one point was, Go in, go within, speak to what you know, speak to what you know. Speak to what you know and know that it's going to change over time for you because we're all evolving. Has anyone got any other questions or anything? Is there anything on the chat? So I, I, if one, one thing comes to mind about the principles um, and speaking to what you know. When my daughter had that terrible car accident, uh, and I had that intuitive information that held me together that night that she was gonna be okay uh, afterward. So this was pre-principles for me. Afterward, I had a period of being extremely anxious because I thought, oh my God, lost my husband. And I almost, I mean, that she walked out of the car. The only thing that was intact in the car was the cab where she sat. And, uh, it was incredible the car did not catch on fire because it sparked as she slid upside down several hundred feet down on country road. And I, and I started to have panic attacks. And a friend of mine, uh, a friend of mine told me, because I was really having trouble sleeping, she said, Linda, every night install the angels at the corners of your bed. So install the Archangel Gabriel and the Archangel Raphael and the Archangel, whatever they are, I don't remember their names. And, but I did at the time, no. And so I installed the angels. And because of that, I was able to sleep. So for a long time, I thought that the angels had come and sat at the posts of my bed and sprinkled berry dust on me and I'd be able to sleep. Now maybe they did. I am open to that possibility, but I don't know that. I didn't see them. I didn't have visions about them. But years later, when I came to the principles, I thought, oh my God, that is hysterical. Because as soon as I installed the angels at the edges of my bed, I stopped thinking about my worries. I quieted down and I fell asleep. So the power was in what an I did. Now, if I had known, if that was all I'd known, I don't think I ever told anyone about that, but if that was all I'd known to tell people to install the angels at the edge of their bed, that was what I would have known. 
and I would have been telling the truth as I knew it. But now that I know the principles, I know deeper truths. And I wouldn't tell anyone that because I really don't know it. I don't know it. I have not had a direct experience of seeing angels at the foot of my bed. But I know what it means to have your mind quiet down and in the quiet to lose your worry and stop your panic and be able to sleep restfully. That I know. That I've done a bazillion times. There's nothing I would share with you that I don't have not because I check that often. Do I know this? Have I had direct experience of this? And I try to teach from what I know and have direct experience of and be clear when I'm flying by the seat of my pants on faith because it feels right. We have uh, Karen with her hand up. And I think Claire was, I, I don't know, Claire, if you were trying to put your hand up or not. And Linda, how are you doing for time? Like, just I, uh, I'm, I'm good for about another 10 minutes and then I should go. Okay. So uh, Claire, because I saw you trying to do your hand first, is, was you trying to um, put your hand up? So just, yes, no. Uh, <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> Claire, please, there you go. <laughs> I think she's trying to unmute. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I've loved the conversation, Linda. Thank you so much. Um, I think it, it's just so useful to hear um, because, I mean, I have times where I get an anxious at times and, you know, have sleepless nights, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, just hearing what you said about um, wisdom always being a positive feeling um, and the difference, because, because I, I was wondering, you know, how, you know, sometimes anxious thoughts, you might believe what that, but that always comes with a negative feeling. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. But have you, have you got any tricks or tips with trying to quieten down when you are having a bad night and you can't sleep, for instance? No. <laughs> yes, yes and no. You know, what, what helps, helps me, Claire, and I love your smile, it's gorgeous. Uh, what helps me is... that it is to, to have sort of a little bit of an understanding that the brain is just going to do what the brain does. And, and if, if we've been in a, a somewhat of a stress state, you know, maybe, or maybe we're tired, we're really, sometimes what happened, sometimes the reason I have trouble sleeping is that I'm literally overtired because yeah. I've been pushing myself too hard and I'm running on a lot of adrenaline. That's the most, common thing and so my body is kind of trying to process all the adrenaline that that's pumping and and it really helps me to know that the brain is just doing what the brain is doing it's it's trying to housekeep it's trying to calm itself down it's trying to make sense of things my body is trying to metabolize all the things all the chemicals that are going through it and to know that I'm not that I'm not that that's an experience that I am having, but I am this divine being of love, this divine observing being that's just watching that. And I don't have to be frightened by it or bothered by it. Yeah, I might rather go to sleep, but you know what? Since I don't seem to have a choice right now, I'm just gonna watch it. <laughs> just gonna watch it sort of fly through my head. And you know, we make up a lot of stories about how not getting to sleep is awful. And we start looking at our watch, you know, and that just makes it worse. And so more often than not, 
and then out I find when I start to leave that all alone and just relax about it, the way I think of it, my metaphor, and everyone has their own metaphors, maybe you have one you can share with us, is that I think of it as I'm putting up my psychological umbrella and hanging out, hanging out in the spiritual half of the cell and just letting the thoughts do their thing, you know, rain on my parade. And I kind of like the way rain sounds on an umbrella. So <laughs> I don't try to make it stop. It's just kind of, you know, you know, enjoy the fact that I'm alive. Hey, I'm alive. I get to experience this. I get to see that. I get to have this feeling. There's going to time going to come a time when that's not going to be the case. And so for right now, I'm just going to enjoy being alive. Even though sometimes alive is fraught with pain or discomfort or dis dis-ease. Uh, I'm not gonna get all tied up in that. And more often than not, it's finding that feeling of that, that the next thing I know I'm asleep. No, that's great. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Claire. We have Karen, do we have time for one more, Linda? What do you sure. feel? Like? Yeah, sure. no, I do, yeah. Incredible. You are just incredible. Okay, Karen. These are great comments and questions. Hi, Linda. Hi, Karen. I just you look familiar. I think we met at Viva last year. I, I wasn't, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to say thank you. I came across the principles three years ago. And um, at that time, I was an energy healer. And over the last three years, that side of me is really shut down within the three principles community because I always had this feeling because of what people had said to me that it, it wasn't allowed, it wasn't the done thing, it was, you know, it's not the principles. But over the last few months, um, I mean, I continued to do my energy healing. I was just very quiet about it. The fact Good. That, but over the last three months, I've really sort of decided I didn't want to hide anymore. <laughs> and I just wanted to be me because I felt like I was really shutting me down. So to hear you talking this way tonight has been absolutely amazing. So grateful. Thank you. You know, in the beginning, Karen, I'm so glad to hear that because in the beginning, Sid talked a lot about energy and and that we are energy. There is nothing that isn't the principles. And, and years ago, I went to a workshop that really helped me in this regard. Um, I, I was listening to a dream, a dream expert, a really nice man, Arthur Bierman, who had one, a really interesting experience. He was working with a client who had bladder cancer. And in the midst of the work with her, her as a psychologist in the midst of the work with her he discovered that he had bladder cancer and she had a dream she came to him and and she said art i had a dream and in the dream a native american shaman showed up a healer uh, and and she was not a person who had a, a lot of experience with indigenous wisdom so, so this was a surprise to her she didn't know what to make of it she said, but the feeling was so incredible in the dream. And the healer talked to her and he said, there are three ways to heal, good, better, and best. A good way to heal is to reach outside yourself for help. Take a pill. See a doctor. Read a book. Consult a therapist. A better way to heal is to find someone who knows how to move energy in the body with their hands. And the best way to heal is to have a direct experience of the divine. And that night, both, that day, both of them healed of their bladder cancer spontaneously. Wow. <laughs> so I, that helps me. Uh, I wouldn't hesitate to go to an energy healer if I had something going on in my body. Mm. I, I had an energy, uh, I had an experience with a well-known energy healer. He showed up at a workshop that I was doing. He was, he was, it was a rare for him to be in the U.S., but he was there, and someone was really excited for me to meet him. This was before the three principles for me. And he came up to me afterwards, and, I, and he said to me, he said, what people don't understand is that um, we have to teach people 
about how thought and energy are connected. Because without doing that, people can develop a dependence on energy healers just like they can develop a dependence on drugs. And so my thought would be that you are perfectly primed knowing what you know about thought and also understanding energy in the body that you are beautifully primed to help people to learn how to move energy through the body on their own. Well, I don't use my hands. Um, I use my intuition and we release energy that's stuck from traumatic experiences. Um, pictures stuck in the mind, memories, all sorts of things. And it's, it just has profound results. It's, it's amazing. I believe that. And, you know, uh, if, if you all get a chance, uh, on my website, on my blog, there's a blog called Pearls of Wisdom. And it's an unusual blog for me. But what happened with that was I, I was really sick in March. I thought I had the coronavirus. As it turned out, I did. I did or I didn't. And I got a, I got a test that was inaccurate. But I, I was sicker than I've ever been in my life. And spontaneously, a woman who I knew of, but, and I'd met, but I didn't know really well, uh, reached out to me. She contacted me via email and she said, I was, I was guided to reach out to you. And, and she, she, I know what she had seen on Facebook that I had said I was struggling with kind of a mysterious illness. So she reached out to me and uh, she shared a story with me. And it's in the Pearls of Wisdom blog, but essentially uh, she met Sid, uh, a family member was healed uh, as a direct result of Sid's teaching. And one of the things said to her that I thought was really beautiful, one of the questions was, should this family member continue to get pills, the pills that she was taking to control uh, some really difficult symptoms? And I love this. Sid said to her, he said, dearie, the pills are God. Yeah. And going a little bit further, she got sick. This person got sick later in her life with a, a really mysterious lung ailment that was never cured. It actually destroyed a lot of her lungs. And she's not able to work anymore the way she was was and she said but but uh Sid had told her that there were times when illness was a process that was a great teacher and she said I've learned more as a result of this illness and I've gotten deeper with regard to the principles and what Sid taught as a result of this illness than ever before and I now see that my primary work in life is to hold a ministry of silence And I, I, you know, I just really love that, that even in this mysterious illness that she's accepted, she's never going to ever fully feel her physical capabilities. She feels like she's doing more important work in the world than she's ever done. Mm -hmm. I really encourage you all to read that, that story because it's rich. It's rich on a lot of different uh, levels about the, mysterious connection between our physical and our energetic and spiritual health. Thank you, Linda. Oh, thank you so much, Karen. And, and Linda, I couldn't honestly thank you enough. Um, there you go. <laughs> and, um, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to say uh, or you would like to add. Um, the sense of freedom that I, I feel this has brought and uh, very, I think, very needed for the current times. And, um, and it's, 
very rich, so we can all embrace everything instead of like um, maybe have an understanding and then suppressing certain things, thinking that that is part of the understanding. And this is very liberating for the way I I see it. Um, just embrace it, embrace it all. Yeah, it just makes no sense that someone like Karen, who's had direct experience of healing using energy, would suppress that for any reason. It makes no sense. And if if it's if there's one thing that the principles that Sid was really clear about is that the principles make complete common sense. They point to complete common sense. Right, so we, uh, Rachel says, I always feel so peaceful after hearing from us. <laughs> Shana, thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, for being here. Um, and Leslie had to go, but she left her, her absolute love because uh, her beautiful husband was making dinner. So uh, she had to go. <laughs> and, uh, so a few have said that they really enjoyed it, but they have they have to go. Um, and uh, Christopher oh, oh, brilliantly has come out and come back and, 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 and he's still with us, so lovely. So thank you everybody. And thank you, uh, Linda, so much for being here. Uh, thank you for thank you for welcoming me into your living rooms, your bedrooms, your kitchens. <laughs> it's been fun. <laughs> I mean, I saw I saw dogs and cats coming around, and then you know um, it's beautiful. And uh, so uh, before we go next week, we're going to have Dave Hill, and uh, and um, I know Linda that uh, uh, Bill has been working with him. And uh, so Dave uh, has been in some of our conversations. You, you've seen him around and uh, he, um, he's been, uh, he is a veteran and, and he's been working with veterans around uh, PTSD mostly and um, with the principles. And so he's gonna talk about his own experience and um and he's called it scared of doing the wrong thing so yeah. it ties really lovely with with what we've been talking uh, <laughs> about um so and uh yes yeah, so that is next monday at 6 p.m here in the uk so that is 10 a.m pacific time so 10 a.m where linda is there in arizona um with her fan and then the aircon and uh, <laughs> four degrees or something. And uh, about, uh, I think it's 1 p.m. in Eastern, in the Eastern coast. Um, and then so, so six on Monday here for, for the UK. And uh, thank you everybody so much for being here. We'll find that story that Linda said that you, you got on your website and we'll post it there. Also, Linda, where can people find you? Uh, my website, www.thedrspettit.com, thedoctorspettit.com. And I have, uh, I'd really encourage you if you're interested in these topics, these kinds of topics, to sign up for my blog. I have a, a separate blog page on that website and also a work with me page where you can see some of the things I'm doing. So we'll put we'll put all the all the links and if there's some we don't have we'll ask you Linda yeah. okay. um, so people can and and please so Linda also has like different things to work with her and she's absolutely amazing as well I don't have to say we've been here for you've been yeah. so incredibly kind I can't understand how you've been like for two hours and a half <laughs> nearly with us <laughs> yeah, because she she's also giving us half an hour before the call so. You are amazing. We love you so much. Thank you so much. This has been sweet. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, all.